It is now a well-known, heavily studied fact that the modern-day bird was once a very different-looking animal – evolution in the form of a radical transformational adaptation, forced upon them by gradual changes in the Earth's environment, from which they whence came, that being the dinosaur. We now know this to be fact, thanks to modern technology. Our capability to now scan these fossils, some found remarkably well-preserved, still fortunately containing many things, which have allowed us to discover that dinosaurs had bird brains. Or more accurately, birds have dinosaur brains. With current investigations even shining light upon the reality that many of these gigantic animals, including the T-Rex, once had manes made of feathers. This drastic change from the dinosaur, resulting in the vast array of creatures we see today, from the ostrich to the albatross, even to the commonly domesticated budgerigar. Yet they all share one common trait, a significant reduction in their size. Even animals which survived unchanged, such as the crocodile, still shrank considerably. This shrinking of said species having been demanded of them by environmental changes. Evolutionary adaptation, as we have covered in the past, is, in the channel's opinion, in its true sense, an adaptation of specific sets of vertebrate types, the true definition of species, not as Darwinian theory posits, of leaps between such. Thus, evolution witnessed within the animal kingdom is not indicative of a shared single ancestry, but inseparable branching from specific vertebrae or phyla groups, never proven to have leaped from one to another. As such, modern-day birds could in fact be seen as the product of de-evolutionary adaptation, possibly derived from cataclysm, which deprived them of the resources needed to remain at such gigantic sizes. The reason for this digression is the channel's postulation of this same process, having once possibly occurred to Homo sapiens also. Could this explain why some of the oldest ruins are also some of the most advanced? With many remaining beyond the reach of modern man's ability to understand them, is it possible that man once had a much higher intellect than us today, due to a far greater sized cranium? Simply put, were we once giants, just as modern-day birds were once dinosaurs? Legends and accounts of ancient giants can be found all over the world, also featuring in many ancient religious teachings. Additionally, many of the still unexplained sites of Earth regularly feature doorways many feet, sometimes even meters above that which is required by and for humans of our modern scale. The Terracotta Army, for example, is believed by many independent researchers, including Mystery History, to have been made by a lost civilization, and their average height, intriguingly, is much taller than modern man. Many accounts exist of giants, which share similar descriptive characteristics. Red hair, double rowed teeth, elongated skulls, etc. With many accounts of red-headed giant remains actually discovered and excavated all over the world, yet often all that survives of these reported events is a small news article, regularly noting Smithsonian involvement in said recoveries, yet seemingly and conveniently always slipping away from the public domain. Lovelock Cave being another example, locals tell of it once being the home of a group of red-headed giants, which was eventually blocked and the giants burnt alive, a giant handprint still visible on a rock in the cave presumably made by one of these individuals during their unpleasant demise. Yet what has to be the most compelling piece of evidence, fortunately still in view to suggest giants did indeed once exist, are footprints found all over the globe, once laid down upon sediment, now fossilized into solid stone. These footprints range in size up to a few meters in length indicating that humans, at some point in the distant past, may have been even larger than many dinosaur species. We find the evidence to support the hypothesis of giant ancient humans highly compelling. 
There have recently been some astonishing academically contradictory discoveries unearthed throughout Europe. Archaeologists have been discovering a network of underground tunnels, apparently somehow cut throughout the Stone Age, which cover the territories of Spain, Turkey, and most of the European continent. Their approximate age, according to funded archaeologists, is no less than 12,000 years. Yet how people living within the Stone Age, people without any form of metal tools or chisels, managed to cut thousands of miles of tunnel systems is clearly a considerably contradictory mystery. Thousands of underground tunnels stretching from Scotland to Turkey that have, predictably, placed the many submissive, order-taking funded scientists throughout the academic world at a dead end to explain. However, if one presumes, as the evidence we share here on our channel often suggests, that a past, now lost, highly advanced civilization once flourished here on our Earth, their creation is less of a challenge to explain. Yet the purpose for their existence will remain an enigma. Were they created by a group attempting to hide from something? Or possibly, they were ancient smuggling tunnels, left by members of this lost civilization once used to smuggle items from ancient settlement to settlement found throughout Europe. German archaeologist Dr. Heinrich Kusch, in his book Secrets of the Underground Doors to the Ancient World, states that the tunnels were dug beneath hundreds of Neolithic settlements all across Europe, and the fact that so many tunnels have survived indicates that the original network was much larger than that which still survives. Quote, in Bavaria alone, we discovered 700 meters of these underground tunnels. In the Austrian Styria, we found 350, and throughout Europe there were thousands of such tunnels, from the north of Scotland stretching to the Mediterranean itself." End quote. The fact that these tunnels have been identified as having been cut at least 12,000 years ago should indicate to all those still with the capacity of critical thought that they are undoubtedly far older than this, as to state that they were somehow cut by people with literally no tools to their disposal, to us, seems laughable. The tunnels are all relatively narrow, being about 70 centimeters in width, just enough for an adult man to travel through. In some places, there are small rooms, storage chambers and seats, clearly indicating that these cave systems were used by a number of people at a time. How did our ancient ancestors create such an awe-inspiring network of tunnels without the utilization of some form of tunneling equipment, lighting, and indeed smelted metal tools? It is not surprising to us or anyone who has paid attention to the limited tale of events put forward by academia that these tunnels remain a perplexing ancient artifact for them to explain. Yet we feel they are clear evidence of a past civilization having crudely cut these tunnels, possibly for some nefarious reason we are yet to unravel. They are undoubtedly highly compelling. There are many ancient anomalies which can be found upon the Giza Plateau and indeed across much of ancient Egypt as a whole. Many areas which are clear evidence of a highly capable, highly intelligent past civilization who once called this landmass home. Not only are the ancient pyramids a clear feat of incredible ancient engineering, possibly the most astonishing found the world over, but many of the still existing ancient temples are testament to a now lost, yet once incredibly advanced ancient civilization. And although many academics are funded to push the theory that the pyramids, having once been the burial places of Egyptian kings, the truth that we still do not actually know the original purpose for these ancient structures remains. Not only do these structures, along with many other areas such as the basalt floor found at their feet, still show clear evidence of lost technology unquestionably left by high-speed, high-rotation stone-cutting technologies, and many of the tombs and other artifacts found throughout the ancient ruins unarguably once machine-worked upon enormous, as yet unexplained lathes. But there also exist some astonishing features within the record books, documented anomalies within our own antiquity, 
regarding some of the biggest yet still existing anomalies within ancient Egypt, anomalies that although are now all but lost to history, have been recorded and documented since our own records began, specifically Roman records. The Colossi or Colossus of Memnon are listed as containing some of the largest megalithic blocks that have currently been recorded and investigated across the world and although these statues have virtually crumbled over the eons, records of these statues stretches back many centuries, features now largely, and we believe, deliberately ignored by mainstream academics. These statues once possessed an astonishing characteristic, one many claimed as a divine experience, one which would draw countless individuals on a pilgrimage across the desert, to witness at first light every morning. The Colossi of Memnon were built from a single piece of stone each. They are oriented towards the sunrise at winter solstice, and throughout modern study have had a number of fearless individuals expose their true past grandeur to the world. Estimates for the two statues' original weight are most commonly noted to have been around the 1,000 tons mark, with the most famous report within R.T. Gould's A Book of Marvels, 1937 which contained an estimate of 1,200 tons. The statues are made from blocks of quartzite sandstone, which was quarried at El Gabal El Amar, near modern-day Cairo, then transported 420 miles to Thebes. And although modern academia would like to attribute these feats to our more modern ancestors, namely the ancient Egyptians, any logical explanation of how this feat was achieved, or indeed how they were so precisely carved, remains absent from all explanations of these monumental statues, not only their transport and creation, but how these ancient monuments used to sing. Early Greek and Roman tourists who came to hear the sound gave the statue the name of Memnon. Memnon was a hero of the Trojan War, a king of Ethiopia, who led his armies to Troy's defense, but was ultimately slain by Achilles. Memnon was said to be the son of Eos, the goddess of dawn, and after his death, his mother is said to have shed tears every morning. The singing of the statues was attributed to this mother mourning for her son. The earliest written reference to the singing statues comes from the Greek historian and geographer Strabo, who claimed to have heard their song during a visit in 20 BC. The second-century Greek traveler and geographer Pausanias compared it to the string of a lyre breaking. Others described it as the striking of brass or a strange, ghostly, almost divine whistling. For more than two centuries, the singing statues brought tourists from all over the empire, including several Roman emperors. Many left inscriptions on the base of the statue, reporting whether they had heard the sound or not. Nearly 90 inscriptions are still legible upon their base today. Who created these statues? How were they able to sing? They are clearly an astonishing ancient accomplishment, once achieved by a now lost advanced civilization. Monuments which we find highly compelling. We can visit other people with their habitation. We can keep track if there's something very important to be developed from the moon. Together, we can explore the moon and develop the moon. We should go boldly where man has not gone before. Fly by the comets, visit asteroids, visit the moon of Mars. There's a monolith there, a very unusual structure on this little potato-shaped object that, that goes around Mars once in seven hours. When people find out about that, they're going to say, who put that there? Who put that there?